All right, welcome everybody to Cultivating Learning, Deconstructing Text with Critical Reading. I am so excited to be here with you today. In this session, we're going to explore techniques to help students build skills to navigate complex issues, construct their own answers, and more with primary sources. My name is Tess Porter, and I am a digital content producer at the Smithsonian Office of Educational Technology, the office behind the Smithsonian Learning Lab. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by Ashley Corin, who is the Women's History Content and Interpretation Curator at the National Portrait Gallery and the ha Acting Head of Education at the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative. She is our expert guest today and is going to be sharing these great techniques to dig into primary sources with students. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tess. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm happy to meet those who are joining us this afternoon or evening or morning, regardless of where it is that you're from. Very, very happy to be with you. As Tess mentioned, I'm, I work for the American Women's History Initiative. And as the acting head of education, um, I develop, evaluate, um, and deliver um, our educational program. Um, but the biggest thing, right, is disseminating information about the history of women in America. So I decided to use this concept of critical reading to help us understand both the concept, but to also intertwine a little bit of women's history into it, um, just because it's awesome. Um, so like I said, today, Tess and I are going to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, the concept of critical reading. It has become increasingly important for all of us, right? Not just th those who are watching, both me and Tess as well, as consumers of information, to have the ability to interrogate content, not just the kind of content we see in the classroom, but outside of the classroom as well. Now, reading critically is not necessarily about being contrarian, right? This word critical doesn't necessarily mean to critique, right? What we're doing is approaching text with a set of questions um, to help us understand its purpose and its value, right? So that's what we mean when we say we're reading critically. Like I said, my area of focus is women's history. So we'll be using two objects in this session to help us understand the context, but to also sort of dive into a period of art history that I think is super cool. Um, and that is the feminist art movement of the 70s and beyond. Would you mind going to the next slide, please, Tess? Yeah, absolutely. I am so excited to dig into these topics with you. And to do that, we're going to spend a lot of time on the Smithsonian Learning Lab today, which many of you may already be familiar with, but this may be new to some of you. It's a free online platform for teachers and students where you can discover digital museum resources, create interactive learning experiences, and share your discoveries and creations with others. We won't spend a lot of time talking about how to use the Learning Lab today, but there are plenty of resources to help you get started on your own if you need it. The main resource is the Help Center, which you'll find at learninglab.si.edu slash help. On this uh, center, you'll find step-by-step -step instructions on how to do everything on the lab, like search for resources, like some of the ones that Ashley is gonna be sharing with us today, create collections of your own to engage students with these resources and more. On this page, you'll also find um, all of our upcoming webinars, just like this one, and all of our archive sessions. Um, coming up, here's a sneak peek of other sessions that will be uh, airing within the next two months. We have sessions focused on getting started with digital museum resources, creating collections with digital museum resources, and other cultivating learning sessions just like this one that dive into techniques to engage students with resources. Again, you can find the schedule for all of these upcoming sessions on the Help Center, but you'll also find links to all of our archive sessions. And this is a great time to say that this session will be archived. Um, so if you need to leave early, if you want to share this session with a colleague, you can do so by sending them the link that you're watching the session at now. You'll also find a link to this archive session on our Help Center after it airs. Um, 
a note too that this session, we want this to be interactive. We really want to hear from you. We want to make sure that this is as helpful to you as it can be as we dive into these ideas together and think about ways to bring them into each of your own individual classrooms. So at any time during the session, if you have an idea, if you have a question, please share it with us in the chat. Um, if you're joining us on YouTube, you can share your uh, comments and questions in the chat by using the chat box, which you'll see to the right of the video. And if you're joining us on Facebook, um, you can share ideas and questions using the comment box, which you'll see below the video on Facebook. So in the chat already, I typed this in there, but I want to verbalize it um, as a way to get started and to warm up using the chat. Please uh, feel free to introduce yourself, um, share a little bit about who you are um, and what and where you teach. Um, two, Ashley, I think we have a question that we want to get started off with today, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, I'll turn it over to you. Um, before I dive into the question, I just want to give a plug for the Learning Lab, which is fabulous. Um, and both myself and my team heavily utilize Learning Lab to help us form ideas, um, particularly getting and learning about new activities to use in our programming. Um, so please check it out. Um, even Smithsonian educators use it all the time um, to be inspired um, and to learn new things about our collections. So. And with that, so as Tess mentioned, um, today we'll be using primary sources to interrogate this idea behind critical reading. And so before we sort of dive into the first object, the first question I'd love to pose to everyone watching is, what is the first question that you ask yourself when analyzing or annotating a primary source, right? So if you have a document, a photograph, um, a uh, velvet vest from the 19th century, right? When you're looking at a primary source, what is the first question you ask yourself when you're trying to figure out what it is you're looking at? So usually when I'm looking at a primary source, one of the first questions I ask is, who made this? <laughs> Who made this? I want to know who made this thing. Um, other than, you know, what is this? Um, who made this is always a great question to start. And I see uh, a comment. Thank you, Christine, um, which is another great question, which is what do I notice or wonder, right? So when you're looking at a primary source, what is the thing that catches your eye? The first thing that catches your eye when you're looking at that object, what are you drawn to? Um, it might be the words, it might be the colors, it might be a, a line in the text, um, but sometimes it actually helps uh, inspire curiosity regarding the object when we sort of think about what we notice, what we first notice when looking at an object. Now, mm -hmm. Tess, what is the first question that you ask yourself when analyzing or annotating a primary source? One of the first questions I ask myself, I think, is when was this written? Mm -hmm. to try and get a sense of the context that this is taking place in. Is this something that's taken place within the last 10 years? Was it 100 years ago? Um, that perspective, I think, really helps me understand a little bit more about what the author is trying to communicate and why. Exactly. You have some great uh, observations in the chat box, right? Someone, again, talking about the period. What place is this from, right? What mm -hmm. part of the country? What neighborhood, town? Um, Maureen mentioned um, looking for connections, right? What are the personal connections one might be able to make between themselves and um, the audience, right? And, and, and Philippa mentions, you know, who wrote it? Um, and another important question is who is the intended audience? Mm -hmm. What is this primary source for, right? When you're looking at a diary, obviously we are not the audience for the diary, right? The diary is a private, um, object, right? An object that people use to share their thoughts. Um, it was not really made for the rest of us to be reading, honestly, but we're reading it. Mm -hmm. So, And I think all these questions are incredibly important that help us understand, like I mentioned, both the purpose and the value of a primary source, right? Asking all these questions 
before you really truly dive in, both before and after, right? And I think that's really important when sort of doing this work of, of critical reading is that you want to ask these questions not just at the beginning or at the end, you wanna to continue to ask yourselves these questions because content changes, right? What you might assume at the beginning of reading a letter might change by the time that letter finishes. You might have a completely different idea of who the letter was for or why it was written. Um, and so the idea behind critical reading is constantly sort of doing this work um, as you're interrogating a primary source. And I will mention that, you know, the work of critical reading is really hard and difficult sometimes. Um, and it requires thinking very carefully and engaging with an object sometimes very slowly, which is very different than how a lot of us are taught to engage with objects, right? Sometimes we don't have a lot of time. Um, and so the thing about critical reading is that you're making the time, you're making the effort to ask these questions in a really careful way. And I want to point out before we move to the next slide, something that Philippa has mentioned, which is incredibly important when thinking about primary sources, is that there are multiple variants of the source, right? Is the first edition of something, right? Is it a copy of something, right? Um, thinking about, is it an object that, um, you know, maybe has changed over time due to environmental factors, right? So we wanna always be thinking about um, how different things affect a primary source, depending on sort of when it was made, what it was made and who it was made for. Absolutely. And I wanted to circle back to something you said earlier about spending time it reminded me of what Christine put in the chat in the beginning. It's really, it reminds me of a lot of the way that I approach exploring artwork and objects. Exactly. You can learn so much from any type of object, including documents, if you just spend the time to really look at it, pay attention to what you're noticing and the questions that it raises for you. And an important thing about critical reading too is you're not looking for answers, right? The point of critical reading is to not seek an answer to all of your questions. It's more a reflective process, right? So some of the things you can't answer with research, right? You can figure out when something was made, who made it, um, but sometimes it might actually take you a long time to figure out the answer to your question. Maybe, you know, there are books that I read as a teenager that, you know, or letters that I've read as a teenager that I don't get until I'm much, I didn't get until I was much older. Right. So sometimes with experience or with engaging with other materials, you come to understand the meaning of something. And so the point of critical reading is not necessarily to check off a box and answer questions. It really is about this reflective process, which can continue even after you've read or engaged with an object. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for sharing uh, your questions in the chat. So shall we move ahead to the first object that we want to look at? Yes. So we're actually cool. going to do a quick warm up with one of my favorite objects ever, right? Um, so what I would like you all to do is um, take a moment to read this object. I will actually read it out loud as well, but take a moment to read the object. And once you know, you've taken in the object, I'm going to pose a couple of questions just to warm up, right? This idea of strategies for critical reading. So this is an object called Calling Card by one of my favorite artists, Adrian Piper. It's from sometime in the late 1980s. And this is an actual calling card. So this is an actual, like it's very tiny and it's something like a business card that you would hand out to people. So keep that in mind as I am reading the text on this art object. So it says, dear friend, I am black. I am sure you did not realize this when you made or laughed at agreed with that racist remark. In the past, I have attempted to alert white people to my racial identity in advance. Unfortunately, this invariably causes them to react to me as a pushy, manipulative, or socially inappropriate. Therefore, my policy is to assume that white people do not make these remarks, even when they believe there are no black people present, and to distribute this card 
when they do. I regret any discomfort my presence is causing you, just as I am sure you regret the discomfort your racism is causing me. Now, what an art object. Mm -hmm. Now, just take everything in, read it another time, one more time if you need to. There's a lot going on in there. Mm -hmm. And once you're ready, I would love for you all in the chat box to respond to the first question, which is, who is the author? I'm going to put that chat or that question here in the chat for you to reference. Who is the author? Now, as you all are thinking about this idea of who is the author, it, it does seem like a simple question, right? Well, you know, Ashley, duh, it's Adrienne Piper. Her name is right there, right? It says it on the card, A. Piper, she is the author. But I want to take it a next step, okay? So I asked you, who is the author? But I want you to think about, given this card, who could be the author of this card? So the card itself is a way for Piper who um, is African-American, but has a fair complexion, um, who is sometimes mistaken in this, as the card says, as a white person and sometimes experiences microaggressions, right? Mm -hmm. So a few of you in the chat box have actually found really interesting responses to my question, who could be the author, right? And the author could be any Black person, right? Because this card sort of deals with microaggressions and people making assumptions about who's around them and what affects people. And so I love the idea that some of you are thinking about, well, yes, Adrian Piper is the one who has written this card, but this card and this experience could represent someone else, right? Someone who is in a room who is overhearing Islamophobic comments, right? For, for people who may not assume their religion, right? Or people who may not assume race or gender, right? And like, and like Philippa says in the chat box, right? The card makes you think that the author could be anyone, right? Because many of us have experienced being in social spaces and we've, some of us have overheard really harmful comments, right? When people have assumed that certain individuals are not in the room. And as Philippa says, this asks us all to pay more attention to what people say, particularly if it could harm another human being. So when we ask who's the author, we're not just asking who wrote this, right? We're also asking who could be the author? Is this something that could happen to someone else? Is this someone else's story? Or is it similar to someone else's story? Yes, thank you, the learning insights, right? Someone who's experienced racist situations and feels that reading her remarks could make a stronger impression than speaking out loud. That's fabulous. Now, my next question, which some of you have already answered, is what assumptions or generalizations are being made in this particular art object? So Tess, I know that you've engaged with this object before. When you're reading this really tiny card, what mm -hmm. assumptions and generalizations do you think are being made by either the author, the actual author of this text, or the audience that this person is speaking to? That is a great question. I think 
you know, you've already touched upon some of the possible generalizations that may already be made on the uh, the intended audience of this card or the intended recipient. So in a situation where they are making racist remarks, it's possible that they're making generalizations both about a person and their racial identity, but also about racial identities in general. They're making a racist remark. Um, I see Sonia Adams too is also chiming in um, that an assumption that could be being made here is that black people are a monolith, that they all share the same experience, which is not true. Exactly. And that they all look alike, right? And that, mm -hmm. you know, there's, it, there's homogeneity in terms of, 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 like you said, of the experience, but also what people look like. Mm -hmm. I see Christine too in the chat is sharing an assumption could be that people will always say racist mm -hmm. things. So that's why she has the card where that situation will keep happening again and again. Um, so she's ready for it. And I think Christine, that's a really, that's a really complex thing, right? To be thinking about the anxiety of one having to make such a card, but the anxiety surrounding having to need these sorts of cards, right? Being prepared for, my, for a microaggression or being prepared, right? And what that experience might be like for someone who is constantly anticipating these things happening to them, whether they are happening regularly or not, but this the anticipation of this exchange happening, putting yourself in their shoes is a really like terrifying, at least for me, it's a really terrifying thing, right? To sort of looking over, looking behind your shoulder always, sort of anticipating something like this happening to you is really, really difficult to experience, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. That reminds me too of something that the Learning Insights shared earlier, thinking about the action of like the situation in which you would give this card instead of verbally speaking up. Is that because it feels safer? I think yeah. it would for me in this situation, um, but thinking about why someone would have this and why they would choose this method of communication over another. Exactly. And that's that's a really interesting point, right? What is the, some assumptions are, what is the right way to address these kinds of things? Piper has clearly chosen art as a way to address these behaviors. But is that, is that the best way to address this kind of stuff? And that's why, you know, I love this art object because it raises so many questions that move beyond this one particular moment that this artist was experiencing, right? It asks us to think about when it comes to combating racism, what are the ways in which people, particularly Black people, how can we respond? What should we respond? How should we, what's the method, right? What's the strategy? So this particular card, I want to respond to the learning insights. So this particular card was a part of a performance piece. So as a part of the performance piece, um, Piper would hand out these cards. So think about a lived experience as a performance piece, right? And, and Adrian, if you know anything about Adrian Piper, Piper, she's very much about incorporating her lived experiences as performance art. So engaging people who are not a part of, who don't actually know what's happening, but using these experiences to create art pieces. So this particular card is a work of art by itself, right? The actual card, the text is a work of art on its own as an art object, but it's also a part of this ongoing performance piece that Piper was doing for a number of years. And there are also different cards too as well. So this is number one. There's also number two, and number two is a really interesting card because that also deals with misogyny. So calling card one deals with race and calling card two um, deals with misogyny and dating. <laughs> Something that was interesting the first time I experienced this art piece, I visited a gallery where I could take a copy of specifically card number two with me, as many copies as I wanted to enact that in my own life. And that's what I love about this object is that it's something that we all could do, right? This idea of putting something on a card, 
um, writing our experience or letting someone know how we feel, right? It's a big part of this card is, is letting someone know how we feel and how their language makes us feel um, and just handing it to them. Like it's very mm -hmm. simple. But as Tess mentioned, there's a risk in doing that, right? Because you're not sure how that person is going to respond, but it's a strategy, right? For sort of sharing your voice um, and letting people know that something is not okay. And, you know, I'm not really sure if there are any recordings of the whole performance. Because, um, I mean, she would be doing this in real life, right? So imagine you are at Le Diplomat and <laughs> you're sitting in this <laughs> restaurant, right? And you overhear or the, the couple next to you is saying something really harmful. And this woman, you know, turns around and hands this card, right? So it's kind of the context for how these things were happening in practice. So it was less of a sort of stage thing and more of sort of an everyday um, kind of, well, not everyday, but it was more sort of a less staged occurrence, right? Because a lot of it is depending on the people around you. You never know what the people around you are going to say or do, but Piper taking advantage of that at the same time. All right, and then my final question that I'd like to ask all of you before really diving into um, critical reading is, what might be missing? So we've talked about who the author is. We've talked about some assumptions. But what's missing? Is there a part of the story that might be missing? Are there details that might be missing? I mean, I told you all a bunch about, about who Piper is, but can you tell that from the card? That's really interesting. I think it, for me, the kind of circles back to the questions that I have in looking at this card. You know, what questions do I have that are still unanswered by the information that I have here? And so if I didn't have the information about who Adrian Piper was, I would wonder where this card came from, you know, and thinking about, you know, this is something that someone who is not the artist could give out too. Um, understanding the, the provenance of this. Exactly. And what's also missing is, you know, more in terms of the audience, right? So we know that she was giving out these cards. Was she mostly giving this card out to people in the art world? Was it, you know, because that might be a totally different story than if she's only giving these cards out to folks in sort of the sphere of sort of art and visual culture, right? Or is she just giving it out? Is she on the bus and giving out these cards? Are these cards for everybody? These equal opportunity cards, calling cards <laughs> to give out to everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does she give these out to teenagers? Is it just adults, right? Like who is she giving these cards out to? I just want to know, like on a personal level, I just want to know what happened after she handed out these cards. That's what I want to know is what was the dialogue or did she just walk away? Because I would just walk away. But, you know, what sort of what occurred after these cards were sort of handed out? Um, what was the impact of her sharing her perspective and sharing her experience? That's a great question. I think it circles back to what someone shared in the chat earlier about wondering if the performance piece was recorded. Being able to witness that exchange, um, how did it play out? I'm sure it played out differently depending on who received the card. Um, but understanding that, that's a great question. There's a, another question here too, um, too actually. Someone else also sharing that, um, does everyone get one or do only some people? Uh, Mary Beth asks, does she give them out to other Black people if she is light-skinned? That's an interesting question, too. Yeah. I mean, in the text, it does say that she directs the text to white people, right? Therefore, my policy is to assume that white people do not make these remarks. So my assumption is that these mm -hmm. cards were handed out to white people because she specifies that in the text. But I think that Mary Beth brings up something that is really interesting, right, is this idea of people not being able to place Adrian Piper in terms of her race. How would that experience happen with different types of people, right? And I think that's a really interesting question to think about as well. 
There's another interesting question here, too, about what was their ultimate objective in handing out the cards? Yeah. And I think, one, one of the things around these cards are about Piper asserting her identity as a Black woman. So that's sort of one of the most important things, right, is asserting her identity as a Black individual and reminding people that she is a Black individual. That's a big part of it, right? Um, but also exploring um, social stereotypes, like getting people to recognize stereotypes is a big part of it, right? And calling mm -hmm. people out for relying on these stereotypes. I think that's a big part of it too, as well. Thank you, Ashley. This was a great warm up. Yeah. Would you like me to move ahead to the next slide? Sure. Okay. All right. So thank you all for indulging me in this warm up. You all have essentially unpacked what critical reading is, which is, as this definition states, moving beyond just understanding the author's meaning of a text to consider the choices the author makes to communicate their message, right? Reading critically does not mean being moved, effective, informed, influenced, or persuaded by a piece of writing. It refers to analyzing and understanding the overall composition of the writing, as well as how the writing has achieved its effect on the audience, right? So again, thinking of purpose and value of the text. Um, and in uh, the Learning Lab, which we will point out at the end of the session, um, this definition actually comes from an open access text um, on writing composition for um, college students. So this is where this definition of critical reading comes from. So if you're interested, like I said, this text is open access and they dive really deeply into critical reading. And like I said, one of the reasons why uh, I'm so interested in this topic is because um, I spent a lot of time as a college librarian. And so I was talking to sort of first year college students quite a bit about sort of how to do critical reading, right? How to sort of move from, you know, being in high school to engaging in slightly different ways of assessing text and having to read large forms of text at once um, and having to deal with not having enough time. So like, what do you do, right? How do you parse through um, an essay or an article and be able to really decipher what the purpose and value of it is? So would you mind moving to the next slide, please, Tess? So we're gonna to get to um, some of the key questions that um, that I use when trying to read a text critically, right? So we've already talked about many of these. Um, who is the author slash speaker? What is the writer's main argument or thesis? Who is the intended audience? Is it you? And if it's not you, who is it? And why isn't it you? right? So that's also a question you have to ask. If you're not the intended audience, why not? Um, thinking about any underlying assumptions, both you and the author and the intended audience. Um, thinking about are there any patterns, right? Are there the, thinking about the use of metaphor, thinking about descriptive writing, right? Thinking about similes, thinking about symbolism, right? Are there any patterns in the text? How is the text structured? Right? Is it a haiku poem? Right? Is it an essay? Is it a personal essay? Um, all these things sort of help us understand the text. And then, of course, um, what might be missing? Right? So, what things are not being addressed? Um, are there any questions that you might have? Um, is there a perspective that's missing? Um, so, all of these things are really great places to start when you're reading a text critically. Next slide, please. So we're going to do another activity. Um, and uh, this is actually from um, the Archives of American Art in 2019, did a fabulous show called What is Feminist Art? So they parsed through their collections, um, circling around this idea of what is feminist art, which was posed by feminist activist, um, Lucy Lippard, Arlene Raven, and Ruth Iskin to a number of artists in the late 1970s. And a lot of these artists responded 
And so this is an example of one of the responses that they received. And this whole exhibit was around showcasing these various responses to the same question. What is feminist art, right? And what's great about this exhibit and these responses is that some of these things are manifestos, they're drawings, there's prints. And so even in the response, the response itself is a work of art, right? If you look at this optic in front of us, there's like some circle action and some half circle action going on, right? It's not just a response. Um, there is art attached to the text. And these texts really center around the continuing conversation about what is feminism in the United States and beyond. And the show itself really showcases the complicated ideas behind defining what is feminist art, right? There's no one answer. There's no one way to respond. And so Tess, if you wouldn't mind um, going, uh, zooming in and, and helping us sort of see um, what this artist in particular, Siri Berg, um, has to say about this question, what is feminist art? If you wouldn't mind zooming in. Absolutely. So uh, to give people a little context on what I'm doing right now, I've just switched over from some slides that we have pulled together to the Learning Lab itself, where you can find this resource. And I've just put the link to this resource in the chat too, if you also want to open this up on your own browser and um, zoom in on your own here. Um, the Learning Lab will allow you to zoom in and actually read this text. You can also download it to put it in a slideshow like Ashley did. And there are some buttons that'll help you interact with it as well. But here, we'll turn it back to you, Ashley. Awesome, thank you, Tess. So before we dive in, I'm going to read this one too, since it's a little hard to see with the sort of half circle action going around. But Siri Berg um, is a uh, Swedish American artist who unfortunately passed away a few days ago, mixed media um, artist. Um, and this is her response to this question, what is feminist art? She says, to you, whoever you are, as a painter, I want my work to be viewed and experienced by you for what it is and not for who I am. In my work, I try to cross boundaries and attempt to enter territory hitherto unknown to me. I would like to share this experience with you. I want you to judge it on its merits, its weaknesses, its ability and inability to communicate and stimulate. I need your acceptance as well as your rejection. I do not ask whether you are woman or man. I respect you for your responses. Siri Berg. So that's Siri Berg's response to the question, what is feminist art? Now, what Tess and I are going to do is that we're going to attempt to do a live annotation of this object. Now, the reason why we're doing a live annotation is I think one of the easiest ways to read critically is to annotate the object, right? To insert the questions into the text or to make marks in your text. I know that in this particular time and age, it is difficult since we're all doing stuff on screens. I know that we're all trying to get away from screens. Um, but this is just one strategy, right? If you have an actual book and you're able to actually mark in it, and if you have a library book, please do not mark in that book. That's what we're telling you. Do not mark anything in that library book. But if it's not a library book and it's yours, um, you know, I really encourage you to annotate. But we're actually going to use Google Docs to annotate this object. So, so what we've done is Ashley has transcribed all of the text here just into a Google Doc and she's given me editing permissions so we can annotate this together. And we hope that this technique was the first time we're trying it, but we're hoping it will be helpful to you as you think about ways to bring resources like this to your students too. Awesome. Thank you, Tess. So one of the things that's really important when you're reading critically um, is to make sure that whatever it is that you were annotating, you can see it, right? So this is like big text. You can even print this out, right? And just get a bunch of crayons or Sharpies or colored pencils. You can have a lot of fun with annotation. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to just be you in a black pen or something. You could really have fun with it. 
Um, you can also you can also create like a little legend on the side if you'd like to um, with your marks. Um, but what we're going to do is that um, I'm just going to guide you through some of the questions that we're going to annotate this object the, using the resources we have on Google Docs. So first, you're going to obviously read the text, right? So I read it out loud. Um, but if you need to read it again, please feel free to do so. Um, we're going to go with the second question, which is, um, or sorry, the first question, which is, who is the author? So I'm going to ask tests because we are using Google Docs to, instead of making a physical box, to actually highlight the text with a different color. So in the chat box, could you tell us who is the author of this object? We'll pause for a moment. Sometimes it takes a moment for chat responses to come through on our end. So feel free to put in your thoughts in the chat. And I will say that in this particular object, there are at least two words, or at least, I guess, two things to point to in terms of the author. So it looks like some folks have gotten one of them. Of mm -hmm. course, Siri Berg's name mm -hmm. at the end of the document. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight that in a blue for us. And then for the sake of time, the second is painter. So as mm -hmm. a painter, we know that the author is Siri Burr, and we know that they are a painter. So that is the mm -hmm. author in this particular instance. Yes, thank you, Ashley. Mm -hmm. um, Wonderful. <laughs> the second question is, who is the audience? Now for this, we're just going to underline the audience, who the audience actually is. Again, we'll give you a moment to respond through the, uh, the chat interface. Yes, mm -hmm. you, which could be us, or it could be Lucy Lippard, or Ruth Iskin, or Arlene Raven, right? Mm -hmm. And this view is incorporated throughout this. You know, there are multiple, multiple instances of this. Exactly. Right. And like Mary Beth said, the viewer, reader of the object, but especially the you, right? The people who are asking Siri Berg, what is feminist art? You. Mm -hmm. All right. What are... So we are going to figure out the main ideas of this particular text. So what point is the author trying to make with this text? So what we're going to do with this is that I'm going to ask Tess to whatever the main idea, a point that the artist is trying to make, we're going to make the text red. Gotcha. Thank you, uh, the Learning Insights, for catching one of those instances of you that I missed. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And so y'all can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the main ideas it uh, could be what it is and not who I am. Mm -hmm. That could mm -hmm. be one of the main ideas or my work to be viewed, sorry. This is this is annotating can be really hard because you're like, what if it's this? What if it's that? What if it's that whole thing? 
Hey, that's the great thing about working in a Google Doc. We can extend our highlights, change it up. But yeah, I agree with you. That was when I was thinking of it too. I see too, uh, Mary Beth says, I want you to judge it on its merit. Mm -hmm. Whoops. That's what I'm looking for. Isn't that a good place to look at um, when we're trying to think about main ideas or main points is the verbs as uh, those learning insights. So looking at all the verbs, exactly. um, all of the different actions that Siri wants the viewer to take. And one of those um, for Mojan is transmitting what the author experienced, mm -hmm. asking for a full response, acceptance and rejection. Here, I'll highlight. I would like to share this experience with you. I need your acceptance as well as your rejection. Something that's really interesting about this piece, I think, is it's so succinct. Yes. Siri is so succinct and, you know, being really clear about how she views feminist art or how she would respond to it and what she's asking of the reader, mm -hmm. um, which is almost ending up in us highlighting all of this for the main point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we definitely could. Yeah. So let's take a moment to talk about what are some of the assumptions the author makes in this text? And we're going to italicize these assumptions. Put that question here in the chat for everyone. What are some of the assumptions the author makes in this text? You know, I, I'm always so fascinated by this line. I need your acceptance as well as your rejection. And one of the reasons why I am so fascinated by that line is when we take into account, when we think about this particular moment, when a lot of women identified artists are trying to gain more recognition for their work, thinking about the barriers that they had to face, thinking about the, the rampant sexism that was going on, right, for centuries. This idea of I need your acceptance as well as your rejection is so complex to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because when you think about how many of these women were rejected for their gender, right? Because of their gender. And this person saying, I need your acceptance as well as your rejection. Thinking about the time that they are living in and thinking about the chance of even someone like Siri Bird not being given a shot because of her gender, right? Because on the one hand, it makes sense, right? You want, I want to be a person. I want you to see me as a person, right? I am not just my gender, but also living in a world where her gender puts her in this really complicated situation within the art world, right? If she had been rejected in the past, is it because of her gender? Is it because of her work? How does she know? How do we, how do any of us know, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why that mm -hmm. line to me is so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. It sticks out to me too in that, you know, she wants both. She wants to keep both. She wants to be viewed as an artist who is as equally capable as someone who identifies as a man. You know, she's not asking for just let me be a part of this world, but she wants to be a part of this world equally. 
Yeah. I see some great comments here in the chat. Just going to go through and read them. One of the assumptions, as uh, this Kim, is that the reader has not thought, but is willing to think and consider ideas uh, expressed visually. Mm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I see Philippa too uh, shares, perhaps implicit, is asking the audience to respect her as she respects them. Mm -hmm. Maybe an assumption that they can separate the work from the artist. Yeah. It's very interesting. And Mary Beth shares that you are going to stay and observe the object longer than a quick glance. That you as the, the reader is someone who is going to uh, spend time with art. Yeah. So let's look for some text hints of these assumptions here. So going back to what Ashley was sharing earlier, I need your acceptance as well as your rejection, talking about that assumption about what the audience is going to give her. I think a really interesting one is um, I do not ask whether you are woman or man mm -hmm. and thinking about this from a 21st century lens and thinking about the spectrum of gender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really interesting. The learning insights has a really interesting comment. Mm -hmm. The viewer has started to indicate that they're willing to share an experience with Siri that assumption is followed by the question, how much further on this journey is the viewer willing to go? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Will they stay and engage with her work after this statement or will they leave? Exactly. All right, since we only have about nine minutes left, I want to move on to two things. One is when you're annotating a text, please look, the, please encourage people to look words up. So in this example, um, hitherto, um, I was like, I haven't read Shakespeare in like, you know, 15 years. So I do not remember what this word means. Um, and so I looked it up and I just made the definition uh, clear to myself in the chat box, which I recommend um, everyone does, not just your students, right? Encourage people to look words up. It helps them understand the context of the text. Um, and sometimes, as you all know, words are used in different ways um, and etymologies are always different. So always look up your words. And then finally, the final question is, um, what might be missing? And for this one, we're actually going to create, we're going to put a couple of comments after Siri Burks. We're going to add in some of our ideas about what might be missing from this text. What context is missing? What do you wanna learn more about Siri Burr? What do you wanna learn more about this concept of what is feminist art, right? And the, and the fact that they wanted people to respond to this question, right? These three feminist activists reached out to a number of artists. So and the great- might be Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ashley. Oh, sorry, just super quickly. And what's important is that when you're, I prefer to write down my thoughts about what is missing so I can come back to them later, right? Because maybe you'll learn something else about this exhibit or about sort of Lucy Lippard and crew. And then maybe it'll help you understand or maybe you'll have answers to some of your questions or a little bit of context later. Mm -hmm. That's a great technique. Thinking too about what we experienced during the calling card activity or some of the questions that we might come in with, things that feel missing to us, we can learn as we um, explore the piece. So what might be missing here? Um, one of the things I, that first comes to mind for me is understanding what kind of work Siri Berg creates. Yep. I can make some assumptions based off of the way that she's you know, created this piece of paper that holds this message. And she does share she's a painter with us, but I don't, I may not know anything about the type of work she creates. That's something that's missing here. Exactly. I also want to learn more about her relate. Maybe, like, does she have a relationship with the three women that are posing this question, right? What is, if they have a relationship, if they don't, does she know them? Do they run in the same circles?
see we have uh, two another um, uh, question here in the chat. Once Siri knows my acceptance rejection, will that impact your work? And mm -hmm. if it does, how will I know? Yeah. And one question that I actually tried to find out for myself was, okay, so we know that this is 1977. How did Siri Berg feel decades after the fact? And I, uh, audience, uh, am happy to tell you that Miss Berg did not change her mind in between time. She felt the same way even later in her career than she did in 1977. I think one of the really interesting things to take a step back from this activity as we think about other things that might be missing is these questions that you've given us are so simple that they can use be used with so many different types of pieces. Exactly, exactly. The really basic questions that get you started having a conversation. And, you know, going back to thinking about assumptions, a lot of the assumptions raised, there weren't specific text examples, but I think through, it was through that conversation and that close looking together that we were able to come to those conclusions. Exactly. Would we have been able to do that if we didn't look as closely? I'm not sure. And what's great about critical reading is that you're not just, you're not just interrogating the text, you're also thinking about the way that you engage with the text, mm -hmm. right? You're thinking about the experiences that you have and how sort of your ideas um, and who you are comes forward when you're engaging with with text right a book or an object or a work of art so it's a really cool exercise in learning more about yourself right and the people around you and i do want to point mm -hmm. out something Tess, that philippa also said was that you know these this exercise this concept can be translated to other things right earlier philippa mentioned social media right um, Absolutely. Not just art objects, right? Thinking about the things that you read in newspapers, thinking about social media, thinking about even movies, right? Thinking about, you know, the TV that we watch, um, deciphering song lyrics. I think what's really cool is that you can really sort of use these questions in all different types of context, right? Because it's all the same sort of understanding what in the world am I looking at right now? Um, and how can I engage with it in the, in the most amplified of ways? So. Absolutely. And I think one of the cool things about this too, I've noticed this in my own uh, uh, questioning uh, with primary source documents, but other types of objects too, is the more that you use questions like this, the more that they become the way that you approach documents like this every time. Exactly. Maybe you aren't explicitly asking yourself, um, what's missing, but maybe you are, you know, it becomes the way that students approach documents like this in their own lives. Yep, it becomes, uh, it becomes automatic to the point where mm -hmm. sometimes you can't enjoy anything because you're too busy asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just want to watch NCIS. Um, <laughs> well, with that, Ashley, thank you so much for walking us through that. Um, thank you. As we wrap up looking at Siri uh, Berg's letter, is there anything else that you'd like to share? No, but if you want, are interested in learning more, um, this exhibit is called What is Feminist Art? And at the Archives of American Art. Um, but if you're more interested in learning about, if you're interested about learning more about women's history, please visit um, womenshistory.si.edu. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. I appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ashley. I just put that URL here in the chat. And I want to share something else that I hope will be helpful to all of you uh, watching. Um, Ashley, for this activity, created a learning lab collection that pulls together the resources we just looked at and all of the questions that uh, we walked through together. Um, we hope that this will be something that you can refer back to as you think about ways to bring these techniques to your own students, but also think about what other types of resources might be really great um, conversation starters, really great pieces for you to dive into and analyze. Um, we're going to put the link to this collection in the description of the uh, the webinar itself once we finish airing. But for now, I'm going to put it here in the chat you can access it right away. Ashley is also going to publish it 
So you'll be able to find it on the Learning Lab by searching for Deconstructing Text with Critical Reading. So here you'll find that definition that we started off with, the question that we asked ourselves, um, both of the um, art pieces that we looked closely at, the questions, and I see there's also a creative questions extension here that you've uh, provided as an opportunity to take it further. Exactly. Do you want to talk a little bit about that one? Sure. Um, I love the creative questions activity from Project Zero because I think, like Tess said, it's it takes it a step further, right? So instead of just deciphering the text, like what if things thinking about what if things are moved around or how would the meaning change if the audience was different, right? So sort of really sort of digging a little more deeper um, into the purpose and 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 value um, of a text, right? How would it look differently if Siri Berg was a man, right? Like thinking about things in a very different way. So, I love that. I think uh, that would be both a fun activity, but also it helps you think even more critically about the text that you're looking at. Um, thank you so much, Ashley, for everything today. This was really fantastic. Um, again, uh, this session is going to be archived uh, once we close it out for today. So if you want to watch it again, you want to rewind to catch something that Ashley said, you want to share it with a colleague, you can by copying and sending the URL that you're watching it at now. We're also going to post it on the Learning Labs Help Center, which will also uh, give you links to all of our archived and upcoming sessions like the sessions listed here. If you have any questions about the Learning Lab, questions for Ashley following up on this session, please reach out to us at learninglab at si.edu. That goes to me and the rest of the Learning Lab team. But if you have any questions for Ashley, I can send them right to her. Um, thank you again, Ashley. This was really great. Um, I really super appreciate fun. you taking the time to spend it with us. Super, super fun. Thank y'all. <laughs> and thank you all too for sharing your ideas in the chat. Have a good day.